Well, it is good to be back. We were in Cuba last week and Saturday night we spoke at a church there. Uh, the pastor, Raphael, who's been here before, he's a number of house churches out through Cuba. So he brought all those people together on Saturday night. And then on Sunday morning, we spoke at the church there. Now, this location was about five hours from where we were because the resort right near the church was closed. And so we still wanted to go and uh, we had offerings to take. We had clothes, we had medicine, so many things. So we traveled the five hours to go down to the church there. And a year ago, we purchased a car for that church, if you remember. And so that was the car that came to pick us up, 1953 Pontiac. And it did the job. It took us there. Uh, it was a little bouncy, and all the windows didn't quite work. But the motor was good, and they took us there and back and enjoyed our time there. Perhaps next week we'll see if we can arrange this. We have pictures of, of the ministry there and the families we helped uh, being there. So keep all of that in prayer as we uh, move forward this morning. All right, our topic this morning is the value of pressing in, pressing in. Now our theme for the year is to press on, that we are haven't attained yet, we haven't arrived, but we're pressing on. It's one thing to start, it's another thing to continue, to press on in uh, what you're attempting to do. And so today we're going to take a little different slant on it, and we're going to talk not just about pressing on, but to press in to uh, things. So hope you picked up a fill-in sheet when you came in and can follow along with us this morning. The verse we used the last time we spoke was from Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were unto John. That's John the Baptist. The law, the prophets were unto John the Baptist. But since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. So we shared last week, and I summarized it just at the top of your notes, your place in God's kingdom is accessible, but not everyone will enter in. In the Old Testament, it was hard. You had to go get a sacrifice. You had to find a priest, go to the temple. It wasn't just any place. You had to travel to Jerusalem to offer this and uh, to become in right standing with God through the sacrificial system that was in the Old Testament. And if you wanted to hear from God, you had to go to a prophet, and he would tell you what God is saying to you, so that's changed in the New Testament. That was up to John the Baptist. But now the kingdom of God is preached. So it's accessible to everyone, but not everyone will enter in because the verse at the end said, and every person presses into it. You have to press in. The next point, fulfilling God's plan for your life is achievable, but not everyone will accomplish it. God's got a plan and purpose for every person here. And you can fulfill that plan and purpose. There's no barriers. You don't have to go somewhere. The door is open through what Christ did. He's our priest. His Holy Spirit's within us. He speaks to us directly into our heart. That is available to us. You can hear from God. God can lead and direct you. But not everyone will find it. Because you have to, as the verse says, press into it. It's available for everyone, but not everyone presses in. That's so sad that God has gave his life for everybody in this place. Everyone in the world made salvation available to everyone. Some people just won't press into it. They won't receive it. God's got a plan and purpose for every person here. Wow. Think about that. He knows you. He made you perfect for his plan for your life. You can fulfill that plan, but it won't just happen automatically. You have to press into it. And as we press in, we're going to find what God has for us. You know, without pressing in, our life is subpar. 
you're missing out. You really are. You're never going to find the peace, contentment, joy, satisfaction that was meant for you if you're doing it apart from God. And you're pressing into things that God's not in. It's almost like you're living an unhealthy life. Because in the end, everything you're pursuing, everything you're doing, it still leaves you empty. It's like we need something to heal us. Something, some kind of remedy, some kind of medicine that will put our life back to where God intended it to be. Um, I don't know in the natural if you've ever been sick and you had to take medication. You had a prescription and it came in a certain kind of bottle, a little prescription. It came in a child-proof bottle, a bottle that children can't get into because you would just think, oh, i got to just turn the cap off. But can't turn the cap off. There's a way to get to it, but it's almost like a little secret. Yet yeah, it's not a secret. You have to press down and it comes off. You know the same in the spiritual realm, the remedy that God has for your life? It's just not a simple little thing of, well, I'll just twirl the cap off. It'll, it'll, no, no. There's a secret to entering to what God has for you. You have to press into it. You have to press down. Uncapping what God has for you is by pressing into it. So, Here's the point that I put in your notes. Your God-given purpose and success are not really held in a child-proof bottle. It's held in a mild-proof bottle. In other words, if you just put mild effort towards it, you're not going to open. You can try to turn it, try to find what God has for you, but it won't happen with just a mild, half-hearted, lukewarm pursuit of it. Scripture says you have to press into it. This has got to be something that you apply yourself to. You know, uh, just as a natural medicine is designed so a child can't open it, so God's world and all of his purposes, all that he has for us, is designed that the immature Christian will not enter into it. A childlike Christian, I don't mean childlike in attitude, but just have an immature Christian will have a hard time entering into it because you have to press into it. It's something you have to desire. It's something that you have to do. You have to exert some effort. It can't be a half-hearted search, a listless search, apathetic search. Ah, I'll try it. Ah, it didn't work kind of search. No, this, this is a concerted effort search uh, into things. So immature Christians are not going to find it. Lukewarm Christians are not going to find it. Revelation 3, verse 15, God gives a message to the church at Laodicea, which is known as the lukewarm church. And listen to what the scripture says about this church of lukewarm people. I know all the things you do. Now that's a scary thought. <laughs> God knows all the things you do. He sees what you follow. He sees what you're into. He sees what you're doing with your time. He sees everything. So he tells this church, I see all the things you do. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Oh, that's strong. I correct and discipline everyone I love. Now, here's some contrary truths. 
a contrasting truth. He sees everything you do, and he sees whether it's good or bad, lukewarm. He sees all that, but I want you also to know he loves everyone. He loves you right where you are, even in a lukewarm state. He loves you, and he doesn't want to leave you in that state. So he says, I correct and discipline. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So, so, the, the verse says, so, as a result of this, be diligent, turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. So God is saying, I'm actually standing at the door of your heart. I see where you're at. I see what you've locked yourself into. I stand at the door. I'm knocking. I love you. And if you open the door, we'll have fellowship together. Now, we always think of that verse when Jesus stands at the door and knocks as for non-Christians, and if they open their heart, he'll come in and save them, and that certainly is true. But this scripture is written to a church, people that already knew the Lord. You know, how many times we invite the Lord into our life, we, we just want him to stay in the living room. You know, we want to entertain the Lord. You know, have a nice seat. Uh, you know, I'll get you some coffee. Uh, sort of entertain yourself here. I got some stuff I need to do. And we sort of forget he's in the living room. Hours go by, maybe a day or two goes by. Oh, I'm like, well, come, oh he's still there in the living room. <laughs> But you know what? The Lord doesn't stay in the living room. When you go out and you go into the bedroom, you know, he comes out of the living room, he goes to the bedroom door, and he knocks on the door. <laughs> and he says, you know, let me in. Let me into that area of your life. And so you open the door, but when you come in, you've gone and hid in the closet. The Lord looks around. He doesn't see. He goes to the closet door, and he knocks on the closet door. And he says, you know, let me in. God wants into every area of our lives. He sees what we're doing. He's not content to leave you in that state. He loves you enough. He says, I actually will correct and discipline you. Oh, I don't like that. You know, when I read this verse, it brought a whole different dimension to this whole area of finding God's will for your life, being used of the Lord. Sometimes we sort of feel like, you know, that'd be nice. The Lord's, you know, he, he would like us to do that. But you know, if you don't, hey, you're missing out, but the Lord really doesn't care. Oh, this verse doesn't say this. This verse says he definitely cares. When he comes to you, you're a Christian, you're giving your life to you. He wants to savor your life. And if he tastes of your life, and you're lukewarm, you're indifferent, you're half-hearted. The Lord says, you know what, I spit you out of my mouth. That's not what I designed you for. That's not what I want. That's, that's not satisfying to me. And, and as a result, things begin to happen in your life to discipline you and to correct you and to chastise you. But it's all for a purpose. It's to get your attention to show that this is not what he has for you. You know, many times our life, we don't savor our life either. We're pursuing lots of things, but it doesn't satisfy. You know, you can give yourself to all kinds of pursuits, but it's not going to satisfy you. You yourself won't savor your life. You'll be discontent. You're always wanting more, something different. i got to try this, and need to try this over there. But the problem is, the more you try to, to satisfy your desire... If it's not satisfying God's desire, it won't satisfy your desire. Because he designed you. He has a purpose for your life. All your talents, your abilities. Where you are born, the time you're born, the place you are, the family you're in. That's not without any purpose. God's designed it all. He's, he's pushing it all together. So for you to fulfill the plan and purpose he has for your life. And he wants you to enter it. And he's not satisfied unless you do. This is, this is much stronger. I would sort of present it, you know, it, it's not good for you. But God's saying, no, I'm not content to leave you in that state. 
I'm convinced we go through all kinds of things in our life until we learn the lesson, we're not going to be satisfied. You try to fill your life with all kinds of stuff, and it's not satisfying, and it usually goes bad. You know, anything you try to fill your life with that's not designed of the Lord, it might, it might start off as a good thing, but it's not going to end up good. Relationships don't end up good. Pursuit of your job won't end up good. Pursuit of friendships. Things that satisfy, you get yourself addicted to things because you're trying to satisfy, trying to follow the crowd, trying to do what other people do, but it's not satisfying. I mean, there, God has much more for us than what you can imagine. I, you know, we talked about this in previous weeks. He's thinking about you all the time. He sees your possibilities. He sees your potential. He sees all your interactions. He sees all your connections. There's so many needs in the world, and he wants to use you and, and benefit others through you. He's got a plan and purpose for your life. And, and man, it just grieves his heart when, when he tastes of your life, and, and you're just indifferent. I mean, you, you got a little bit of concern. It's not like you're just cold. But you're never really pressed into it. You're just sort of there. If it comes, fine. But you're never pressed into it. The Bible says it's available to everyone. I mean, there's not one person here that God hasn't thought about and has something special for your life. It's different than the person you're sitting beside. But he's got a plan for your life. Make no mistake about it. And it's significant and it's important. But you need to press into it. It's available to everyone. But you have to press in. Like you gotta, you're going to open it. you got to press and turn it. And when he's knocking on the door of your heart, it's almost like there's a, a child-proof lock on your door. you got to press into it. You can't just be indifferent. Well, Lord, you're calling me. Yeah, I know that you're wanting me to do that. But you're, not, you're indifferent. Your door will not open. There, there is a lock, and, and the key to the lock is wholehearted devotion, pressing in, and that opens the door. So the next point is turn from indifference and be diligent. You have to be diligent. That was in the verse. He says, so be diligent and turn from indifference. You know, sort of come see, come saw. You know, hope, uh, yeah, I hope that works out. Be nice if it worked out. You know, but you're not really intent on it. You need to be diligent. I looked up just the meaning of diligent, and the one that I looked up this time says a constant and serious effort. Constant, steady, continuous, but also serious. This, this, this is important. I, I, I put value on this. I, I'm serious about this. This is not just a whim, be a nice thing, I should do this. No, 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 no. diligence is much more than that. You're applying the effort that's required by what you're entering into. That is the key to enter into the things of God. To find your destiny, to find your purpose, and all the satisfaction and joy that comes from that. It's in that yielding of your life to the Lord. Psalm 77 6 says, I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. Is your spirit making a diligent search? Steady, constant, serious search. Your spirit is making that search. You're meditating in your heart. Your spirit's making a dedicated, diligent search. Good way to know what your heart is searching at or where, where, where your heart is, is to answer this question. Where does your heart go when it's at rest? Your heart's the center of your being center of your affection. Where does it go when it's at rest? You know, we can give our heart to a lot of things. 
You know, we, we give our heart to God, so we sort of like a ball, we throw it up in the air to God. And we put, the more force we put to it, the higher it goes and the longer it stays in the air. But you know what? That ball will eventually come back to a center of gravity. And many times we give our heart to many things and to God, but we've never given him the center of gravity. It's not our whole heart. It's not the center of our heart. We just give him a part of our heart. You see, whatever will compel you, you will press into the center of gravity of your heart. And that's why God says, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. <laughs> He's knocking on the door. He's saying, I got a lot of veil for you, but, but, but you need to be serious, wholehearted, and desire this, and search for it. And if you do, you know what? You're going to find it. But a lot of times, our heart, the center of gravity of our heart is not there. Maybe, maybe your heart comes to rest, you know, when you're not putting an effort towards it. Where does your heart go to? Sports? Video games? Fashion? Entertainment? Career? Achieving? Your heart can go to a lot of things. And they're not all bad things. But God doesn't want it to be the center of your heart. He wants your, the center of your heart to be given to God. Now, this is the amazing thing. It's not hard to serve God when you're giving God your heart. Because everything will pull in your life towards that. Oh, yeah, it doesn't mean that a lot, you know, lust can throw up in that way and pull your heart this way and that way. But, you know, when you are serving God... And you've given your heart to God, your heart will be pulled back to him. Oh, I'm so glad for that. It's not left to myself and my own efforts. I just give him my heart and suddenly the pull is towards God when I give him my heart. It becomes what you're hungry for. And Jesus taught in the first message he preached in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they'll be filled. There's not a chance in the world when you hunger for God that you will come up short, that you'll come up empty. The Lord says, if you hunger and thirst for me, for my will, for my purpose in your life, for what God has that's right for you, right for your design, you're going to be filled. It's going to happen. Hunger and thirst after the Lord. Psalm 86 and verse 11. I, I, this verse is a powerful verse. It says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Now listen to this phrase. Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear, fear uh, your name. See, many times our heart's in all kinds of pieces. I give them a little bit of our heart to that, give them a little of our heart to that, a little bit of heart here, a little bit of my heart there, a little bit of my heart to God. And, and, and we're all over the place. We're not really searching anything. It's sort of our life is a blur. Whatever comes into focus in that moment, oh yeah, I'll go after it. But there's no intention no diligent search. We're just sort of existing and going with the flow. The world says this, I'll go that way. Read that, I'll go that way. The heart's all over the place. The writer of the psalm said, Lord, unite my heart. I remember when I first read that a number of years ago. That really struck me, and I realized, yeah, that's true. My heart's all over the place. I want my heart to be united. I pray that prayer very often. I say, God, unite my heart. I want my heart united for you. I want you to be the center of gravity of my heart. Now, here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't mean you don't have the other things. It's just that it's united in the Lord. So you can do all these things. You can follow your career, follow hobbies, uh, get involved in all kinds of things. 
but it's united with the Lord. But if, if God isn't the center, all these pieces of, the, of your heart will draw you in different directions, and you'll never find the fulfillment and the solidity of knowing God and having your life on a solid rock because there's too many pieces of it all over. Unite my heart. Lord, I pray right now in this moment, unite the hearts of this people. Become the center of gravity. May everything be pulled together towards Christ, that there's not one activity that we don't engage ourselves in that isn't centered in you. Pray in Jesus' name. I mentioned about being in Cuba this past week, and uh, some of us were sitting at the table, uh, a number of us that was together there, and, and I just posed this question. I said, what's your take home from, the, from our time here in Cuba? So everybody shared something. And uh, you could, the beach, nice sun, nice break. I mean, you can go into all kinds of things, what it is. But you know what? You know what was this, the thing that gave me the most pleasure? Was the five-hour jostling trip down to the church and speaking Saturday and ministering to the people and helping them and praying with them and hearing their comments back and connecting with them. Did that mean I didn't enjoy the beach? Oh, I enjoyed the beach. I enjoyed the weather. I enjoyed everything about it, all the things that come with a vacation. But it was united and pulled together by the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean every vacation you have to do something like speak at a church. It, it doesn't. All, but, but whatever you're doing, your heart's united in the Lord. You might go on a vacation, but part of your heart is, I wonder who God wants me to connect with. I wonder who, I, who he wants me to speak with. What in divine encounter does he have for me on this trip? Or a business you're going into, or whatever. Lord, what do you have in all of this? The center of your heart is pulling everything else in. That's what God desires. I tell you, when that happens, you'll never be happier. You'll never be more fulfilled. You'll never have more peace, satisfaction than when your heart is pulled together in God in every aspect of your life, every talent you have, every ability you have, everything you're doing. It's, it's pulled towards God. And so you're enjoying all the stuff. You can enjoy sports and video games and fashion and entertainment, and you go on and on and on with the list. But it's not the center. And everything's being united and pulled towards the Lord. Wow. So I put in your notes, a united heart is a pure heart. A united heart is a pure heart. Pure in that it's undefiled, unmixed. It's pure, 100%. And it is sanctifying everything else. Because God is the first thing in your life. He sanctifies your work. He sanctifies your entertainment. He, he sanctifies all your uh, involvements. You're enjoying it like everyone else, but the Lord is the center of it. And, and people don't understand. Why can you be so happy? You're not pursuing the things I'm pursuing, but you seem happier. It reminds me when uh, we were first married, Kay's sister Brenda came up to live with us. She was a single young lady, and she got a job in an office. She came home one night, and she told us what had happened at work that day. It was a Monday, and she said, uh, came into work, and one of the girls asked me what I did on the weekend, and I said, I went to church, and she said, church? <laughs> and so Brenda said to her, well, what did you do in the weekend? And she said, drink. And Brenda said, drink? <laughs> I mean, it just showed the, the contrast. You know, like a surprise, you got to church? You, don't, you, you went to church on the weekend? I mean, you actually did that? Well, yeah, of course, because it's the center of our life. Well, what'd you do? Well, I drank. I mean, I can't think of anything worse than if your weekend centers around getting drunk. I, you know, I'm surprised how many people in the world that's the way it is. I'm surprised how many people at the resort 
was just one drink to the next drink to the next drink. I'm thinking, man, what an empty life. So we, we want our heart united, pure, a pure heart, united heart that presses into God. Now listen what Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6 says. This is an Old Testament verse talking about Israel that is representative of us today. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love God, your, to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. The Lord says, I will circumcise your heart. What's natural circumcision? It's the cutting away of flesh. And when your heart is circumcised, it cuts away fleshly things, fleshly pursuits, empty things, things that have no value, that makes you insensitive to God. He'll circumcise your heart. You need to pray that, Lord. Unite my heart. Circumcise my heart. I want it pure. I want it after you. Cut away the things that's distracting, that's coming in the way. I want to be wholehearted for you. I don't want to be distracted by anything. And the Lord says if you do, and, and as a result, you'll love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you'll live. I mean, you'll experience the life God wants you to have. You'll really live. You won't just ex exist. Brings me to the title of the book I wrote. Is there more to life than living? Yes. There's more to life than just existing, just living. God wants to give you a new life, a life that comes to you when you give your heart to God. Mark, Mark 12 and verse 20, or 30, sorry. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. I mean, this is the first thing. This is the primary thing. This is what it's about. It's not just God having being part of your life. No, you're loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is the focus. Are you missing out on the other things? No. He's pulling everything into that purpose. So now you're finding the joy of the Lord and the joy of the natural things but it's not my focus. We fully enjoy life because we're searching God, serving God with our whole heart. You worship him. You see, this could be a trigger for us when we come into church and uh, people up front say, that's, that's in here into worship. You need to think to yourself, oh, am I going to worship the Lord with all my heart? I'm going to be half-hearted worship, mind-drifting worship, or will I be focused and I'm going to let every word of the song, I'm going to engage my heart with it, my spirit with it. I'm going to let that verse, those words express my heart. And you're, you're, you're worshiping God with all of your heart. Because Isaiah says, if you just say the outward words, he said, you worship me with your mouth, but your heart's far from it. God wants your heart engaged. What about praying? Pray with all your heart, not half-hearted. You're engaged in prayer. You have a fervent prayer. That's a burning prayer, not a lukewarm prayer. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's going to be powerful, your prayer. But you've got to press into prayer. Not be indifferent about prayer. Not prayer, pray Sunday to Sunday. It's praying when you're at home. It's when people come over that are Christians that there's a time where you pray together because it's the center of your heart. doesn't mean you may not. You, may, you might play cards. You might do a lot of things or whatever activity you're doing, but is there a time where you, you bring your hearts together to the, the center of your being? God's working. God's got a plan for our lives. How can I pray for you? What are you, what are you asking God for? How can I benefit you? I mean, why wouldn't we do that as friends? Or do we meet with other Christians and we never talk about God? We never talk about prayer? Because if it is, you're lukewarm. Doesn't mean the things you're talking about are bad. It just means it's separated from the core of your being. Everything should pull towards the Lord. And you've got to press into it. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with how much? All your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. You're not going to understand why things happen. Talked about this before. You can't explain why things are in my life, but it doesn't matter if I can explain it. I'm trusting in God. You know, the understanding may come later. I'm trusting in God with all my heart. I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm just pressing into God. And then he'll direct your path. Wherever you're to do and go, he'll direct you. You know, many times our pursuit of God is just because, or we lack it, because we're just lazy. (laughs) We don't want to put the effort forward. The next point is this. Laziness is a cancer on your spiritual pursuit. Laziness. It's too hard, too much work. I didn't know it was going to be effort. I thought I was just going to lay back and things are going to come to me when I serve God. I mean, this, what you're talking about seems like work. <laughs> yeah, it is. You've got to press into it. But you know, like the saying go, if you love what you're doing, it's not work. When you love God, it's not hard. It's not difficult because your heart's pulling towards it. You love God. And so, yes, it's work. Yes, it's effort. Yes, you've got to press in. It's intentional. It's steady. It's constant. And you're serious about it. That's diligent. Your heart is diligently seeking for God. You're aware of every situation, as I said earlier. You meet someone. The immediate thought comes to your mind, hey, I'm not just doing this transaction. This person is not just doing this service for me. I wonder, God loves this man, this woman. He's got a plan for the life. I wonder if God wants me to drop a word to them. Lord, just show me. That intentionality of pressing into God, God uses you to say something, to speak something, that you're amazed when the heart opens up and you realize... You know what? God used me to help that person. I didn't even know they were wanting God. But because I was intentional, I was pressing into this relationship or this encounter that might have only been for 10 minutes. But I'm pressing into it because I'm saying, God, I don't know. Maybe I'm here. I'm available. He'll use you. There's such a joy that comes. I don't want to go into the story, but I was listening to a person testifying, and he's in the Ukraine. And he was talking about every day he lives between tears and joy. He said, everything I see brings tears to my eyes. But he said, we're doing a work here. And we're helping people. And he said, it brings tremendous joy to my heart. He said, I'm constantly between tears and joy. You'll never feel happier when you do God's work. Yeah, you're working. I, 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 I... I'm tempted to get off on that story, but I'm going to stop myself. But it was a very powerful testimony of this person in in the Ukraine. And I just realized, boy, they've given their hearts to this. Wow. They're in a tough place. And he said, he said, we're not leaving. He said, people say we should leave. He said, no, God called us here. Give our life for this. He said, we may give our lives for it, but it doesn't matter. We're here. We're helping people. We're between tears and joy every day. See, that, that's work. That's sacrifice. And yet, you could tell the man just exuded the joy of the Lord. He wouldn't want to be any other place but where he is. Do you want that? Do you desire that? Is that something? But laziness, this indifference. Listen, here's some verses on it. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent will be made rich. You can desire something. Oh, I wish that would happen. I wish that. Well, I, I pray and ask God to do that, but nothing seems to be happening. Did you press in? Or are you just trying to turn the cap? Or did you press into it and then it on caps? Everything God has for you. You got to press in. Every man, every woman presses into this. If you seek the Lord with your whole heart, you're going to find him. It says in Proverbs 10, 4 to 5, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. 
He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. The harvest is there. All you got to do is go out and reap it, but uh, sleeping. Can't be bothered to get up. Proverbs 24, the lazy man will not plow because of the winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. This verse says in another translation, the lazy man will not plow for reason of the cold. Too cold. Too cold to go out and plow today. I'll, I'll wait for a warmer day, more convenient day. It's too cold. You know, when I tell that, I, I think of my grandfather different times. Like we had a double house, you know, and the parent, grandparents lived. I'd come home from school many times. I'd see my grandfather out in the field. He'd be plowing. My dad had the farm. My grandfather was retired, but he would, he'd be out there plowing. He'd be all bundled up. He'd be driving. I remember dad saying to me, he said, you know, he talking to me. He said, your, your grandfather does all his plowing. He just works two or three hours a day on it, but he, he's faithful. He's out there every day. It doesn't matter if it's cold, not cold. He, he does the plow. See, a, a slacker, the lazy person, oh, it's too cold today. I won't do that. Another verse. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. Ecclesiastes 11.4. So I, I would go sow today, but you know what's too windy? Wind's just going to blow those seeds away. I'll wait. Too windy today. I think I'll just uh, stay in. Have a cup of coffee, stay by the fire. What so today? And then it goes on to say, and he won't reap because he looks at the clouds. May rain today. Be nice to go out there and bring in the harvest, but you know what? I don't want to get wet. <sighs> May I wait till tomorrow? Not calling for rain tomorrow. See, we can have all kinds of excuses. Laziness will bring all kinds of excuses to your mind. Why you can't press in. Why you can't do it. You know what? You just need to do it. I mean, you just got to have an intensity and a serious and a constant, steady search for God. And you're just pressing through every problem, every difficult. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be deterred because your heart's after God. You're going to find him when you search him for him in that way. Now, in light of all that I said, I, I hope I kindled in you a desire for God. Oh, I wish I could give you a heart for God. I really do. I wish, I wish I could just give you a heart for God. But I can't do that. You've got to press into it. I've tried to cultivate it. I've tried to stir up within you this message today you know the most precious valuable thing I could give you is a heart for God a heart that searches for God that you're not distracted by other things you got a heart for the Lord oh I want a heart for God I want God to unite my heart I want him to circumcise my heart I want, I want to search him because I know if I do it I'll find, I'll find all the joy, all the peace, all the things that my heart wants if I put them first. I wish I could give it to you, but, but I can't. But if you turn your heart to God, and, and, and sometimes just to say, God, you know, I don't know how to do it, but I give you my heart. <laughs> I give you access. Come get it, Lord. <laughs> Here it is. I, don't, I, I, I need you to do something. I need you to unite my heart. I need you to circumcise my heart. Lord, but, but I give you my heart. But that just brings me to the last couple of points in this message. and I'm just going to give it to you quickly this morning. But I think it will help you. When, when I don't know what to do, I don't, I don't know how to start. I don't know how to get on this path of giving my heart to God. Let me give you a real, real secret. This is a powerful secret. It's something that anyone can do, and once you do it, it starts you on that path of having a whole heart for God. And it's simply this, sow a seed of service.
Lord, I, I, I want your will for my life. I don't know what it is. What, what do you want me to do? Well, what you do is you start serving. I mean, you go right for the juggler. <laughs> you, know, you know what the juggler is in the spirit? The servant is the greatest. The greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant. Not the ones with most talent, most ability that is accomplished most. No, no, it's the servant that's the greatest. And so you just say, God, where can I serve? Where can I help? What can I put my hand to do? And that's the verse under this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your, all your might. So you just, if, if you're in the church and you say, well, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what to do. Just offer your service to something. Say, how can I help you? How can I help with this ministry? Do you need any help with this? you need any help with that? And whatever you do, you do it not half-heartedly. Well, I can do it maybe Tuesday, Thursday. No, it doesn't mean that your schedule doesn't come into place. What I'm trying to say is that you're, you do it with all your might. I mean, this is something I'm giving myself to. I'm going to serve. I'm going to benefit. I'm going to help other people. I'm going to be alert to the needs of people. It may not be in the church. It may be in your neighborhood. A neighbor that needs help. Maybe it's a classmate. How can I help them? What can I do for them? You're helping. That, that desire to serve, and you sow a seed, I tell you, it will bring benefit because God wants us to do, be about his work and his business. And so you may not even know what I'm starting to do, whether that's the thing, but, but you just start. You sow a seed. One thing leads to another. Brings us to our next point. Your gift makes room for you. Your gift will make room for you. You know, some people say, you know, there's no place for me in the church. Well, maybe you haven't given your gift. Because your gift will make room for you. Now notice, it's not your giftedness that makes room for you. I'm gifted. I have ability. I've told them that I'm good at this. And I'm waiting for them to ask me. I, I've given them lots of hints that I would, I would get involved if they would ask me. I'm gifted. That doesn't make room for you. <laughs> it's your gift that makes room for you. What do you actually tangibly give to benefit someone else? So don't wait for someone to ask you. Just say, how can I help? You see a need and you move and fill it to the best of your ability. But you don't come in saying, I'm going to do this and this and this for you. No, you're a servant. You just come in and say, how can I help? You tell me what to do. And whatever they give you, do it with all your heart. It might start off as a menial little job that, you might think, oh, well, anybody could do that. But that's where you start. You sow a seed. I guarantee there's a place for every one of you because you're all gifted. God's given ability to every one of us. And you just got to start serving wherever it might be. Get your mind off yourself and start thinking about someone else and how you can benefit them. I'm telling you, that is a door. If you'll press into that door, that opens a whole realm to you. It's going to bring you to the place God has for you. You may not even know what it is, but you started to do it. Now listen to the verse that goes with this. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5. You do not know the works of God who makes everything. Like you don't know everything that God's doing. How could we? You don't know everything that God's doing. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. You just start somewhere. You just start doing something. You don't know whether that's really where you want, are to be. I tell you, it will soon come evident because your gift will make room for you. And you'll start being positioned in the place that is needed because God works that. So you just do lots of things. In the morning you sow your seed. In the, in the afternoon you sow your seed. In the evening you sow your seed. And you don't know whether this will happen or this will happen or both will happen. Scripture says, you know, you're just, you're just sowing your seed. But you're going to reap. 
you're going to have a harvest that's going to come. I'm trying to give you some very practical advice that's gold. <laughs> this, th this is gold for you to find your place in the kingdom of God. Just start serving. Start sowing a seed. After the first service, an individual came up to me and, and said, you know, that really spoke to me because and, and I won't go into the details, but he just said, you know, there was a ministry opportunity came and I didn't know whether I wanted to do it or not. And he said, I volunteered. He said, I got involved. Uh, I, it was something really outside of my comfort zone. And he said, but that led to this and that. He said, I'm not in that ministry now. But he said, I'm doing this and I love what I'm doing. But see, he had to start somewhere. He, he laid hold of that truth and he said, I experienced that. I just, I just started volunteering. And God sorts it all out. Here's the last point. Your harvest is commensurate with your sowing. To the degree you sow, to the degree you get out of bed and you say, At the wind may be blowing, it may be cold, and it might rain, but you know what? I'm going to sow. To the degree you sow, the harvest is going to come back. And the verse is so powerful in Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If you sow with thimbles, it comes back with thimbles. Sow quarts, it comes back in quarts. Sow bushels, it comes back in bushels. Sow in truckloads, it comes back in truckloads. The same measure you use, it's going to come back to you. So press into these things. Be extravagant. So here, there, everywhere. Because God will sort it all out. It'll bring you to your place. And rather than sitting back, oh, I don't know what my gift is. I don't know what I should do. I want to see God. And, and he's, God's savoring your life. And he doesn't like it and you don't like it. And God says, just, just start serving. Just start giving. Give your gift. Whatever that gift, it might be your talent, it might be your ability, it might be your time, it could be money, it doesn't matter. It's whatever God says to you, just give and sow. And you'll be surprised what comes back into your life. Let's press in. Shall we stand together? Would you turn your heart to God as I pray this prayer? Father, we read your word and it rings true. Lord, you want not just part of us, you want all of us. And Lord, we confess that many times we have been indifferent. We've been half-hearted. We haven't really been serious. We've been drawn towards you, but we haven't really given ourselves to you. Lord, I, I pray that my heart would be united that you would be my sole desire I pray this for myself for my family my extended family I pray this for our church Lord every family every individual in this church that this would not just be a theme that we talk about but this would be a reality that we are pressing in like never before that we're not going to be content for a half-hearted effort, but we're going to seek you with all of our heart, search for you with all of our heart, involve ourselves with all of our heart, knowing that you are there to meet us and to bring the results back in our life. I ask, Lord, when you taste of our life, that it's pleasing, that, you, that we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. But we want to, to do well. We want to fulfill the purpose you have for our life. And Lord, take away, and anyone that's here today, that thought that 
they're excluded. They don't have ability. They don't have the talent. Lord, may everyone realize you, you have a perfect place for them. And may we press into you and find it. I ask this in Jesus' name for your honor and glory. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, thank the Lord for this word. Take it, digest it, act upon it. Go in the name of the Lord, fellowship around a coffee, talk about these things, sign up for a small group, let God lead you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.